Val Luton was a film producer who made primarily horror films from 1942 to 1951 that focused more on mood and atmosphere and what you don't see rather than outright scares. The vast majority of his films were made at RKO and he primarily worked with three directors in his time there, Jacques Turner, Mark Robson, and Robert Wise. He also had a tendency to use a recurring group of actors. I recently watched all of his films and now I'm going to rank them. Number 14, My Own True Love, and number 13, Please Believe Me. Luton only made three films not for RKO. These are two of them. It's a little unfair to lump these in with the, those other films because they're pretty different from everything else. My Own True Love is a straight up melodrama that is fairly boring and not very memorable, although all the actors do their best. Please Believe Me is a romantic comedy starring Deborah Kerr, which I actually enjoy it. Judging from Letterboxd, though, my opinion <laughs> is definitely in the minority, but everyone in it is giving it their all, and I thought it was pretty charming. I didn't enjoy it as much as the other 12 movies on this list, but it's okay. Number 12, Youth Runs Wild. Youth Runs Wild is a 1944 film directed by Mark Robson and tells the story of a bunch of no good teenagers running wild and falling into delinquency. Get off my lawn, kids. This film had a lot of interference from the studio and the release film is not the one Luton wanted, so much so he later tried to get his name removed from the film. What we're left with is a pretty dull moralizing film about the dangers of teenage delinquency, but there's still something there. You can tell that if he was left to his own devices, we could have a, had a really great nuanced look at the real world struggles of World War II era teenagers, neglectful, abusive parents, the effects of war and home, all infused with Luton and Robson's brand of horror. Because as we all know, there's nothing scarier than a teenager. Number 11, Apache Drums. Apache Drums was Luton's final film before his untimely death at the age of 46. It's a B-Western directed by Hugo Fregonese. I should, I, I gotta figure out a better way to get pronunciations for these. And it's about a degenerate gambler who changes his ways and becomes a hero when an Apache tribe attacks the town. I think you could describe Luton's filmography as fairly progressive, at least for the time that he was making films. And Apache Drums continues with our protagonist standing up to some racism in the town, introducing legitimate Apache grievances against the white settlers, but it still falls into the Western tropes of turning Apache people into a faceless horde of savages. If you're willing to look past that, you get a really solid Western for the first 60 minutes, and then a really spectacular final standoff. Luton really amps up the horror of the situation with a lot of surreal style from Fregonese. Number 10, Mademoiselle Fifi. I had a Muppet book growing up, the kind where you read and there are little pictures that correspond to buttons with sound effects, and one of the buttons had Miss Piggy saying, foo foo, foo foo. And that's what I think of every time I think of this film. And now I hope you do as well. Mademoiselle Fifi is a 1944 film directed by Robert Wise, a period drama about class dynamics and integrity and sticking to your values, specifically during war. Elizabeth, a laundress, is sharing a coach with a bunch of upper-class jerks during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, when they are sidelined at an inn by a Prussian lieutenant nicknamed Mademoiselle Fifi. He won't let any of them leave until Elizabeth has agreed to dine dine with him. Simone Simon gives a terrific performance as the staunch patriot Elizabeth and the scene where the elites are downstairs celebrating as she's upstairs getting assaulted by the lieutenant is harrowing. Number nine, The Seventh Victim. Released in 1943 and directed by Mark Robson, The Seventh Victim tells the story of a young girl who sets out in search of her missing sister and ends up descending into the world of a satanic cult. You could describe any of these films as moody and atmospheric, but The Seventh Victim might be the moodiest and at most atmospheric -iest. There's a dread that hangs over the entire film that doesn't let up. And if you've seen the film, you know that that ending, the dread lingers for a while after you watch. This is the film that I think will most benefit from a rewatch and might slowly creep up the list as time goes on. Number eight, The Leopard Man. The Leopard Man, directed by Jacques Tonnerre, unravels like a modern day true crime story. After a leopard escapes from being used in a nightclub act, there are a string of deaths that happen in a small New Mexican town, which are blamed on the leopard. But Jerry Manning knows something's up and sets out to discover the truth. What he finds is, and this is a big spoiler, a man driven mad by witnessing the original death of a young girl by the leopard, having awakened in him an insatiable need to kill. He committed every subsequent murder. It's a little silly, but in a way that I find really fun. And when you throw in some great tension before every single murder, the young girl walking home alone at night and seeing her death from inside the house as her mother desperately tries to get her, let her back in. Another young girl gets locked in a cemetery overnight. A performer, Clo Clo, could have been 
a one note character, but we get to see her as a caring mother before she heads back out into the night to search for some money she lost sealing her fate. Number seven, Bedlam. Bedlam is the third and final collaboration between Val Luton and horror icon Boris Karloff, and I love these two together. I wish they could have made more films because seeing Karloff in these big juicy roles is so much fun. Here he plays the cruel asylum owner, Master George Sims, who after being confronted by Nell Brown, played by Anna Lee, about his mistreatment of the inmates gets her committed to the asylum. The scene where Nell is surrounded by these men who are deciding her fate is terrific. We share her disbelief as she transitions from confident and dismissive to genuine fear. And that fear is firmly cemented when Nell finally enters the asylum to stay. Again, talking about Luton's progressivism, Bedlam doesn't do quite as well at humanizing the inmates as something like Todd Browning's Freaks does with its cast, but it certainly makes a statement about how we treat those in need of mental care. Number six, the ghost ship. Led by a great performance by Mr. Cimarron himself, Richard Dix, the ghost ship tells the story of a deranged ship's captain and the sailor who attempts to do the right thing by bringing him to justice. I don't know what I like so much about this film. Richard Dix is great as the insane Captain Stone. Early on, there's some great ambiguity about whether or not he actively murdered a sailor and one of the greatest deaths maybe in all of cinema. It's tense, it's paranoid. There's a lot of great discussion of our responsibility in holding people in charge accountable and how easily we can fail at it. Number five, The Curse of the Cat People. Okay, I lied. When I said the seventh victim would benefit most from a rewatch, The Curse of the Cat People would benefit most from a rewatch, a we watch? Most from a rewatch and it's all my fault. I try not to know too much about a film before I watch it. And I imagine my response to this film was a lot like, the people's response walking into the theater in 1944. I spent the first 40 minutes of the film looking for the continuation of Cat People. And by the time I finally let the film be the film it was rather than one I was expecting, I had missed most of it. And that's why I think I'll like this one much more on a rewatch because even with all that bias, I really enjoyed this one. It's a more of a fairy tale about childhood rather than a horror film, but can still be scary in a way that the best fairy tales are. It's about our relationship with the past and how that affects our children. I'm excited to sit back down with this one. Number four, Isle of the Dead. Trapped in a single location with a deadly virus going around and increasing paranoia about a demonic presence? Now you're speaking my language. Add to that, Boris Karloff plays a strict and authoritarian general. I would say there isn't as much depth to this film as most of Luton's work, but it's spooky, it's tense, it's fun, and I loved it. Number three, The Body Snatcher. The Body Snatcher is my favorite of the Karloff Luton collaborations, and I think it's in large part due to the juicy role Karloff gets here. The film is the story of a doctor who hires a cab driver, John Gray, to <clears throat> acquire cadavers for his classes. The film begins with him grave robbing. However, after the doctor's young assistant asks Gray to get a cadaver and Gray can't dig up a body, he murders a young girl on the street. What makes the premise so effective is that you can understand why the doctors are doing this. They want these dead bodies to help the living. And you can almost rationalize them turning a blind eye to the grave robbing if it means they can save people's lives. And then things spiral out of control because they're in league with a maniac. The scenes between Henry Daniel, who plays the doctor, and Karloff are fantastic. And this is the final screen pairing between Boris Karloff and Bella Lugosi. The two of them together aren't what stands out about the film. Lugosi doesn't have much of a role, so they don't get to play off one another like they do in The Raven or The Black Cat, but it's still an interesting note. Number two, Cat People. 1942's Cat People is probably the most famous of all of these Val Luton films, and with good reason, the story of a young woman descendant from a people whose passion turns them into deadly cats. It's really about sexual oppression, the fear of female sexuality, and generational trauma. They're the most well-known scenes, but the scene where she's stalking Jane Randolph is actually genuinely scary. Scarier than anything Universal horror I've seen so far, as is the scene in the pool. But my favorite Val Luton film is number one, I Walked with a Zombie. Directed by Jacques Tonnerre, Tonnerre is definitely my favorite of the Luton directors. I Walked with a Zombie is the Caribbean version of Jane Eyre, and it's not even so much the plot that I liked about the film, although I did find it engaging, but the mood, the atmosphere, this gothic horror set in this tropical plantation works so well. And then the history, the subjugation and enslavement of black people on the island is just layered onto the story and adds, not scares, but weight and dread. All the performances are great. 
My favorite moment happens when Sir Lancelot, a Calypso singer who appeared in three Luton films, is caught singing a song that explains the family scandal at the center of the movie. He comes over and apologizes, but later at night we get this very creepy interpretation of the song. Ah, oh, ah, me, shame and sorrow for the family. Ah, oh, ah, me, shame and sorrow for the family. And that's my list. I ordered these films, but honestly, they're all pretty great. And depending on my mood, I could rearrange them all. Val Luton was ahead of his time in the horror genre. And it's a shame we didn't get another 20 years of movies from him. If you want to see how I rank the 19 movies from 1930 that I just watched, you can click that there, wherever it is. Just click it somewhere. And I started in 1930. I've been watching about 20 movies per year. I'm starting in 1931 with Fritz Lang's M.